Welcome, I'm Corey Newton. This video is the rules of the game and the size of the pie, the old equity efficiency trade-off, the decision society has to make between redistributing the existing size of the pie to its members or growing and expanding the pie outward. Just to review where we get our law from, where we get the rules of the game from, first source is the Constitution of the United States that sets out the general rules of the economic game. It also has specific provisions to provide public goods and services and military goods and services. So that's where the general rules of the game and these specific constitutionally authorized public goods and military goods and services come into this picture. Uh, this video we're going to focus on the other sources of law, statutes and legislation, administrative regulations, and judicial precedents. And that's where we end up with our social insurance, and that's the uh, basis for these other pressures on the production's possibilities frontier from expanding, which are market failures, externalities, redistribution, and inequality. These are the four main reasons why statutes and legislation are passed that prevent the production possibilities from frontier from expanding and encourages a continued redistribution of the existing pie. So we're going to go down all these and explain a little bit about them. We'll talk a little bit more about these and give a little bit of a remedy and a prescription for growth and the reasons why we need to expand and grow out. First, let's go to uh, market failures. Market failure occurs when a good is not produced, a good or a service is not produced to a socially acceptable level. Now, the best example of this, let's take the health insurance marketplace. Let's take the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. A lot of people refer to it as Obamacare. I'll just refer to it by its name, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Now, what they perceived as a market failure was a socially inoptimal amount of people having access to health care and the insurance market. They, they perceived that to have failed. So what they did through statute, through legislation, and now a whole bunch of administrative regulations, and even through judici excuse me, judicial precedent, and went up to the Supreme Court. So there's all three of them, all three of them for you. Market failure was replaced by a government failure, which was funded by redistribution. All right, let me say that again. The perceived market failure in the health insurance marketplace was replaced by a government failure through statute and administrative regulation and judicial precedent called the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, which was funded by redistribution. So, you know, there's other examples of market failures. Most of them are public goods. The market doesn't produce enough public goods that are socially optimal, which is why they are written into the Constitution, and many more are written in through statutes and administrative regulations. So the thing about a market failure, which is interesting, if you look at it, if you look at the production, a rational economic decision maker will change the status quo when they, ex they expect the benefits to exceed the cost of doing so. So in the case of production, you know, if a firm does not expect the benefits of producing something to exceed the cost, they're not going to they're not going to produce it, and that's why it comes to a socially suboptimal level. Now, if you think about that for a minute, if they cannot produce something that's going to clear the market, why would they produce it? So, in that case, a market failure is really not a failure of a market; it's a failure of the good or the service. It's a failure of the good or the service to be able to clear the market at a market price. So I would argue that it's not a market failure. It's a failure of the good or service, which is why they're written in the Constitution. This is why they pass through statute and administrative regulation. Let's move on to externalities. An externality occurs when a third party bears the cost of the production or consumption of a good or service. So the best example of that is pollution. Let's say you have, you're producing a product, you're producing a good, and there's some sort of toxic byproduct that's not worth anything. You know, so you've got to get rid of it. So now you can go about it through the, 
you know, legal channels and dispose of it properly, or to save costs, which a lot of people have done in the past, they go dump it in the river, they dump it down the road. So the third party has to pay, you know, they have a cost of that stuff being dumped there. They have an environmental cost. They have a health, potentially a health cost. The property values can go down because they've got a bunch of toxic waste sitting somewhere. So externalities are, you know, a, a major so source of statutes and administrative regulations. And there's, you know, there's production externalities, there's consumption externalities. Like a good example of a consumption externality, a textbook version, is secondhand smoke. You're consuming a tobacco product, a secondhand smoke, you go and harm other people. You can even say fireworks to some extent are an externality. You know, you could be enjoying fireworks, you can be consuming fireworks, blowing them off, but if your neighbor is trying to sleep, you know, there's a cost to him. He's losing sleep, and then he's got to go do something in the morning, and he can't do it because he's tired. So, you know, you can have a fireworks externality. There's also positive externalities. Let's say somebody produces something, and the benefit, you know, a lot of people get benefits from, but they don't pay the producer. There's a, an example of an externality. Consumption, you're consuming something that has benefits to a bunch of people who don't pay for the use of that consumption, but it benefits them. There's another example of an externality. So externalities are important. I mean, I'm not advocating, you know, pollution and dumping toxic waste and doing all these other terrible things. But there is a way to negotiate between the firms and the consumers and the producers. All right, we need these certain efficiency benchmarks for it to be prof profitable. And on the other side of the coin, the people who are going to be, you know, usually... In this case, it's a case of the officials or the people affected by it. They have to say, okay, well, we understand your efficiency benchmarks, but you need to understand our, you know, environmental benchmarks, for example. So and then you can come together between, all right, we need these efficiency benchmarks to be able to produce. Okay, we need these environmental benchmarks to be met so you can also produce. So that's externality. So there's pressure for market failures and externalities on the production possibilities frontier not to expand and to stay at the per present level, and then, you know, the proceeds of the, the current PPF are re redistributed. Excuse me, redistributed. All right, now we have redistribution itself. Redistribution itself, you know, it's set up through the Constitution, that the taxes can be laid and levied to produce public goods and services and military goods and services. You know, you look at the Tea Party. Okay, these, you know, wannabe public finance economists were concerned about the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, and they were concerned about that redistribution. They're also concerned about taxes. So they're, you know, very, there's an example. The Tea Party is very concerned with redistribution. You know, you need it to some extent because it's written into the law, but, I mean, they have claims of, you know, it's out of control, it's out of control. But, you know, at its essence, it's needed. It's built into our system. So you're not you're not going to get rid of it. You can argue about you know how far it should go, but you're not totally going to get rid of it. Inequality. That's you know another set of wannabe public finance economists. Look at your Occupy Wall Street. You know their main mobilization and their one of their main points was the inequality that exists between you know the top one percent and the other ninety nine percent. Now inequality is all. That's another thing like redistribution. You cannot get rid of it. You cannot get rid of it. It's because of the, uh, the division of labor. Not everyone can be a CEO. Not everyone can be a CEO. So you need somebody who is going to sweep the floor, who's going to wash the windows, who's going to build the building, who's going to drive the trucks, who's going to maintenance the trucks. Okay, and that division of labor has a lot of different things. What do people have a comparative advantage in? What do people have an absolute advantage in? What is their skill set? And their talents, their natural skills, their natural talents, you know, what are they going to choose to specialize in? You know, whether they're going to make the investment into learning a trade, are they going to make a human capital investment to go to college to specialize in something? Are they going to put in the time to learn it and gain experience? And as they do those things, whatever field they choose and whatever division of labor, where they fall in the division of labor and whatever field they choose to specialize in, you know, their productivity is going to be exchanged for a wage. Their productivity and output is going to determine what their wage is. Okay, a job is created when the employer expects, okay, this person's productivity and output is going to cover their, their cost of their employment 
and I'm going to make a profit as well. So, you know, inequality we're not going to ever be able to get rid of, as well as redistribution, as well as externalities. And market failures, I, it's kind of debatable. I would argue we could get rid of market failures completely, but, you know, that, that may not happen as well. So, you know, let's get back down to the rules of the game and the size of the pie. As we mentioned in the earlier video, you know, public goods and services, we have crumbling infrastructure in the country, roads, bridges, a dated power grid. You know, you want updates, you want high-speed rail, you got dated train tracks. Okay, so this costs hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars a year. Military goods and services with a global, global commitments and global capabilities to fulfill those commitments. That's more hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars a year. Social insurance, you know, you have the baby boom generation getting on Social Security and Medicare. You also have Medicaid because economic conditions are not optimal. So you have many more people available, eligible, excuse me, for Medicaid. You have many more people eligible for food stamps. You have many more people eligible for unemployment. You have many more people available, excuse me, eligible for TAMP, temporary census for needy families. So all of this costs money. Okay, Dr. Kotlikoff, Larry Kotlikoff, out of Boston College Economist, has estimated that there's a fiscal gap just in social insurance and all, just, just these things right here, that exceeds $200 trillion. And in order to close that gap, you're going to have to significantly raise taxes and significantly cut the budget, or a combination of both, which is not going to happen given the political situation. So if you have the baby boomers retiring, and they're basically all the ones in charge in the, in the Congress and in the Senate, so they all want to make sure that they're paid off of their Social Security and their Medicare. And they're the ones in charge, so they're going to put restrictions on our generation. You know, I'm at the tail end of Generation X, forefront of Generation Y, of how we're going to pay them off. So they're going to tell us we need to, they need to be paid off, and the manner in which we're going to do it without allowing us to expand and just continually redistribute this. It's not going to happen. What we need is economic shock waves. We need an expansion of capital stock, and an expansion of resource availability, and an expansion of technological innovation through changes in the rules of the game. So if they expect to get paid off, they need to ease off. They need to ease off of the statutes and legislation and administrative regulations that continue the redistribution because we need economic shockwaves to pay off all of these gaps. We need economic shockwaves, economic expansion of the size of the pie. We need to grow the size of the pie. Grow the size of the pie through improvements in the rules of the game, which will increase capital stock, which will increase resource availability, and will increase technological innovation. And we need to keep expanding it. We need to keep expanding it out because the cost the cost of the increased cost of debt and increased cost is exponential in public goods and services, military goods and services, and social insurance. Unless we have an exponential level of growth to offset the ex exponential cost and debt of these programs, the whole thing is going to collapse. So in essence, we need to expand the production possibilities frontier. We need to expand the size of the pie. We need to find a rate of exponential economic growth to offset the rate of exponential debt growth and cost in these programs. Stay tuned for more. Thank you again.